Is uh, Abe here? I am Chair Foster. Okay, how are you doing? Good. Do you have everyone from your team here? I am not sure. Uh, I see Dr. Wolfman. And I'm here as well, Abe. Great. So yes, uh, Chair Foster, I believe that we are ready to go whenever you are. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, Aaron, are you all set? I am all set. Yes. OK, all right. We can go back on the record then. OK, on the record. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, we'll have our afternoon hearing of November 13th, and we'll have the One Care budget presentation and um, questions and answers. So I'll uh, turn it to Mark Hengsler to swear in the One Care team. And then after that, uh, if Michelle Sawyer has an overview or any information she'd like to provide, I'll open that up to her. And if not, Abe will turn it directly to you and your team. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. So I'll go ahead and swear in anyone from One Care who will or may be providing uh, testimony today. For anybody who is planning on doing so, just please go ahead and unmute yourselves and then raise your right hand. I will read the oath to be prescribed for witnesses. Do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. I do. Yes. All right, you're sworn in and I will turn it, Michelle, to you. Thank you, Mark. Slides going. All right, as Chair Foster said, we are here today for the FY25 budget hearing for One Care Vermont. We're going to kick off with just a brief staff intro, um, and then we'll hear directly from One Care, and there will be time for board questions healthcare advocate questions and public comment. So here is uh, an overview of the timeline. It has been changed a little bit this year. Um, so earlier in the year, we released the guidance in late May, which is a couple of months earlier than usual, um, or not a couple of months, but several weeks earlier ahead of schedule. Um, and then in June, the board approved One Care's FY25 risk mitigation plan, which is usually done as part of the budget overview itself in the fall. But in this case, we decided to get that done ahead of time. In late August, One Care submitted their certification verification materials for FY25. Uh, the GMCB staff is still working through that process. On October 1st, One Care submitted their FY25 budget to us, and we are here today uh, for their budget hearing. The staff, the GMCB staff, will do a presentation on One Care's budget on Wednesday, December 4th. And a couple of weeks following that, on the 18th, there will be board deliberations and a potential vote. I'll hand it back to Mark to give us um, some guidance about the legal review. Sure, this will be pretty similar to what we did earlier this morning for Medicare only ACOs, but starting point of difference for public knowledge, oversight of ACOs at 18 VSA 9382 provides for a certification uh, process, which is relevant to one care as an ACO that accepts, accepts payments for Medicaid and commercial and a budget process, which is relevant to any ACO operating in the state of Vermont. We're here today to talk about budget 
Uh, go ahead to next slide, Michelle. Thanks. Similar to what we discussed this morning, the ACO shall have the burden of justifying its proposed budget to the board. That's at GMCB Rule 5.405A. In deciding whether to approve or modify the proposed budget of an ACO, projected to have more than 10,000 attributed lives, which is the case for one care uh, in Vermont during the next budget year, the board takes into consideration the following. One, any benchmarks established under section 5.402 of this rule. We'll loop back around to benchmarks in a moment. Two, those criteria listed in statute. And here for an ACO with more than 10,000 attributed lives, that's all criteria listed. Three, the elements of the ACO's payer-specific programs and any applicable requirements at 9551 or the Vermont All-Payer Accountable Care Organization Model Agreement, and four, any other issues at the discretion of the board. And uh, as promised, looping around to, to benchmarks, I'll just give an overview of this because we didn't have this uh, this wasn't relevant to our discussion this morning. So the board may establish benchmarks for any indicators to be used by ACOs in developing and preparing their proposed budgets. Those benchmarks are included in the annual reporting and budget review manual or the, the budget guidance document. And the benchmarks assist the board in determining whether to approve or modify an ACO's proposed budget. Uh, so they're not they're not they're not requirements. They're they're benchmarks. They're used to assist the board in its determination. For FY25, the board established benchmarks, which we also call budget targets, during its meeting in May at the end of May, and those budget targets are included in the guidance document for One Care, which, as Michelle said, was established on May 29th. And I think I'll turn it to you, Michelle, to give an overview of those budget targets. Yes, thanks, Mark. So I'll just walk through all eight targets. The first one is that the FY25 commercial benchmark trend rates must be consistent with the ACO attributed population and the GMCB approved rate filings. Two, maintain risk corridors for all public payer programs at minimum of FY23 levels or elect the asymmetric risk corridor offered by Medicare. Three, aside from waivers provided in the 2024 amendment of the APM agreement, One Care's FY25 budget should not support new programs. Administrative expenses should be associated with one, programs as demonstrated to yield positive benefits for Vermonters and Vermont providers, or mm -hmm. Two, programs, resources necessary to support APM requirements, or three, meeting payer contractual obligations and participation requirements. Number four, ratio of operating expenses to PHM or payment reform payments, including FPP and budgeted bonus payments, must not exceed the FY24 revised budget amount. Number five, the ratio of population health management funding to number of attributed lives must be at a minimum of the FY24 revised budget amount. Specific line items may vary based upon any internal evaluation of the effectiveness of individual PHM programs. Six, continue efforts around the three metrics that the ACO has selected to address in response to the March 2023 Medicare ACO Performance Benchmarking Report through the Quality Evaluation and Improvement Plan. The ACO should justify its choice of tactics to improve performance in these areas. Seven, should the ACO choose to participate as an MSSP ACO mm -hmm. in FY25 and leave the all-payer model, one care must that should be must submit a budget that reflects the fact that its value to the state is more limited and must provide any and all additional information as requested by the board. And lastly, eight, the ACO must account for its administrative budget by providing a breakout of the budget by function. And I believe that is the end of the GMCB staff slide. So I will hand it back to you, Chair Foster. Thank you. <clears throat> Any questions from the board before we turn to one care? We can always go back to Ms. Sawyer if that's better. All right, great. Um, 
Mr. Berman, thank you, and I'll turn it to you guys. Great, thank you, Chair Foster. Um, I've been having a couple of audio connection problems, so if that becomes an issue, let me know and I will switch to a different method. Good morning, my name is Abe Berman and I use the pronouns he, him. Uh, I wanna thank you all for the opportunity to present today. I'm proud to serve as a CEO and leader of the One Care team and the participant network. I wanna start off by emphasizing something that I led with last year. Change is hard, especially in healthcare, where inertia is strong and demand exceeds supply in most cases. I can assure you that all of us are committed at One Care, and I know all of you are committed to this challenge or we wouldn't be engaged in this work together to serve Vermonters. So I wanna thank all of you for what you do to serve the state before we get started. The first thing I'd like to focus on is all of this is done for the benefit of our providers and their patients. One of the core precepts of One Care was about creating a shared vision and common incentives across the care continuum to drive change with guidance from practicing physicians and communities across the state. We help providers who voluntarily enter into our ACO deliver the best and most cost-effective healthcare to Vermonters by aligning focus around key population health metrics and providing support, resources, and incentives that otherwise would be unavailable to them absent the ACO structure. By providing those supports and paying for value and better health outcomes, rather than individual services, we are in fact moving our healthcare system toward a higher quality, more affordable and better coordinated model than exists under fee-for-service. And one that we know will keep Vermonters healthier. That is not to say it is a fast process to do that work. It takes time. The second thing I wanna say is that we have good results to share with you today from this past year. From our quality measure performance to financial results, to maximizing the use of waivers, we have done excellent work with our network partners this year. One example is the nearly 1,000 patients as of the end of Q3 that benefited from flexibilities through the ACO to reduce unnecessary hospital days, expedite transfers to mental health services, and receive otherwise unreimbursed nutritional counseling. In truth, though, we've only just started to really realize the full potential of the APM given the disruption of the pandemic. For next year, we're working with home health and others to pilot additional waivers from CMS in order to drive forward even further into this goal of providing additional innov innovations based on the waivers that we have available and continue to drive forward on our quality and cost performance. The third thing I'd like to say is this budget represents our best forecast of 2025. Mr. Boris and Dr. Wolfman will walk you through it in detail and I think you'll agree that we've thoroughly analyzed the needs that we feel are necessary for this final year of the all pair model. That said, we know that this being the last year of operations will undoubtedly face unforeseen issues and challenges. So what I'm saying right now is we will stay in touch with the board and with the HC Human Services as the year unfolds and we'll course correct as needed because there's things we just can't predict, particularly with all the changes we're seeing at the federal level. Point four, Although our leg of the relay is coming to a close next year, we know that the journey continues. As most known at by now, One Care has decided at the close of the APM at the end of 25, we will wind down our organization as we work to fulfill tasks associated with the final year of the model. We all know how important it will be to maintain consistency and approach and funding for participants throughout the transition in 2025, including maintaining the APM across all of the state so we can maintain access to federal funding for the Vermont Blueprint for Health. We are observing positive results in terms of quality and we have a valuable opportunity to dedicate the coming year to further improvements, ensuring that Vermonters continue to receive excellent care for another year. As much as we're focused on operational performance in the coming year though, I want you to know that we're gonna work equally hard to ensure a smooth transition to whatever comes next for the Green Mountain State. Together, we'll make significant strides in transforming care deliver further than we have in the past. And we hope that the foundation that we've established throughout almost the past decade will serve as a strong basis for future innovations. For example, we hope to evolve and build on our core population health management programs and key initiatives like CPR and our mental health screening initiative. We want to expand the use of waivers to continue to cut through more red tape for providers as they seek to provide high value care for their communities. And we want to increase an emphasis on quality measure and total cost of care performance rather than focusing on strict utilization and unit cost containment, which we know doesn't always work. So I want to say that in closing, we remain committed to working with the Green Mountain Care Board and the agency human services to ensure a clean handoff and minimal disruption at the end of 2025 for our providers and patients. 
So now that we're moving into the budget phase, I wanna pass it off to Mr. Boris and Dr. Wolfman to walk you through our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Abe. Hello, everybody. My name is Tom Boris. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for One Care Vermont. Uh, nice to see you all today. Hope everybody is well. You will hear from Dr. Carrie Wolfman, our Chief Medical Officer, in a few minutes. And with that, let's jump right in. Next slide, please. We're going to start with a high level executive summary uh, of the budget. These are the, the bullet points, if you will. As we all know, 2025 is the last year of the all payer model, and that means 2026 uh, will represent a pivotal shift in our healthcare landscape. And uh, while that's difficult, uh, we developed a budget with that in mind. And some of the key strategies uh, that we kept uh, in front of mind when we developed this budget were to first provide consistency for the provider network. Uh, we can all expect some changes. We don't know every detail of what those changes will be starting in 2026. So we wanted to avoid a circumstance where there was substantive change between 24 and 2025, and then again from 2025 to 2026. So as you'll see throughout this presentation, that was a, an important component of this particular budget design. Next, we made very intentional efforts to this budget to comply with the Green Mountain Care Board budget targets that Michelle previously uh, shared with you all. This was important um, and we'll show you a little bit throughout the way that uh, we believe we complied. We're happy to discuss to make sure that we are reaching the same conclusion, but it was a sincere attempt in this budget. And then as we've been doing for the last number of years, the last goal was to manage the cost of ACO infrastructure. I still believe a shared ACO platform that everybody can join into is a, is a cost efficient mechanism, but we were very mindful of the uh, larger economic stresses in our healthcare system across the state, as well as the Green Mountain Care Board's work uh, in the realm of, of affordability. So we wanted to make sure that we did our part in this budget. A couple of the financial highlights include $1.1 billion of healthcare costs in value-based models. I still think this is a good thing. Uh, $27.8 million in investments or incentives to providers to improve quality, improve uh, patient experience and cost of care. We've reduced our operating expenses in this budget by $575,000, and we've reduced hospital participation fees by $1.2 million. It's right between $1.1 and $1.2. A couple of clinical and quality highlights include continuation of our population health model program and our comprehensive payment uh, reform program. Those are two of our primary initiatives. They're staying in a very similar form with just a couple of modifications. And then we're really continuing to focus on waiver utilization. We are learning more and more how powerful and useful these waivers can be to enhance the patient experience when they need healthcare services and as, as well as helping with cost reduction. Next slide, please. Uh, the following three to five slides um, relate to high level ACO program components. After that, we'll shift into revenues and then expenses. And the first part of our ACO uh, budget development starts with the provider network. Uh, in the main, we're sustaining the same network in 2025. There are a couple notable changes, however. Northwestern Medical Center declined participation in all programs. Uh, in light of this decision, we have offered to cover risk for other St. Albans participants, primary care in particular, to sustain their participation in the last year of, all payer, of the all-payer model. Again, this goes back to that provider consistency theme that we'll hit on throughout the presentation. Uh, Notch, the FQHC up in St. Albans Health Service area, declined participation in the Medicare program, but will stay with us in the Medicaid and commercial programs and Northwestern Counseling and Support Services, a designated agency declined participation. From a budgetary standpoint, there's some modest expense reduction due to fewer PHM payments. For example, uh, we won't be making PMPM payments to notch for their Medicare attribution anymore. That will come from a different uh, place. Uh, and NMC participation fees essentially get spread to the other hospitals through our allocation model. This is one of the reasons, amongst many, that we really wanted to manage the hospital participation fees down this year so that it didn't push uh, undue financial stress onto the other hospitals. Next slide. Next in our ACO budget bill is attribution. Uh, this table and all these numbers are estimates of what 2025 attribution will be. We are assuming no substantive changes to the payer attribution methodology. 
Uh, we believe that Medicaid redetermination will largely be over after 2024, which I think is great. It will add some stability to our attribution throughout the course of the year. And we expect that all attributed lives will qualify for scale targets. Uh, taking a closer look at the starting attribution budget table, slight decline projected for Medicare. That 3,100 number is fairly close to the notch Medicare attributions. That's uh, tightly correlated. The Medicare reduction, Medicaid reduction rather, 14,000 uh, lives, that relates to redetermination. The lives that were disenrolled throughout 2024, we just don't expect to come back. Some may they restore coverage, but we don't expect many to come back uh, into the attribution roster in 2025. And then commercial, this is just a tune-up of our estimate based on the latest data that we're receiving for attribution. There are a couple small practices that also uh, closed or retirements, so there's a little bit of other movement there, but no substantive change in that commercial attribution space. And in total, we expect to start the year with 190,000 attributed lives. Next slide. From there, we develop our program total cost of care targets forecast. These numbers are a product of attribution and the benchmark PMPM, total cost of care per member per month amount uh, that will be established in contract. As I said before, these are estimates. We do our best to project what they may be, but each has their own process and actuarial rigor uh, developed to determine what the, the final target will be and executed into contract. Uh, the assumptions incorporated in this budget are that the Medicare target follows the all payer model trend rate, um, which would be 4.0% by our math for next year. The Medicaid trend rate is modeled from historical analysis, what we're seeing in the past. We also incorporate emerging uh, trend or information into our target development. So I want to call out Medicaid a little bit and that we're projecting the total cost of care target to go up next year. There are two driving forces behind that, I believe. First is some repricing activity where Medicaid has adjusted payment rates for a number of services for providers across the region. The second is redetermination. We are observing that as lives are disenrolled for redetermination, their costs on average are lower than the entire Medicaid pool. What happens is that when these lower cost lives are disenrolled, it means the remaining pool has a higher cost on a PM, PM basis or on an average basis. So our projection in this budget assumes that dynamic holds true. Um, but in any event, we will be going through a, the same actuarial process between one care and Medicaid to determine the appropriate target for next year. The commercial trends and the, the slight reduction we see in the, in the total cost of care really is a product of the attribution. And as the budget targets suggest, we believe that our final targets and methodology will comply with the guidance that says the commercial trend rates must follow the insurance rate uh, approved rates by this board. Next slide, please. A quick look at fixed payments. As part of our strategy, we've been able to convert a significant portion of healthcare spend from fee for service into these monthly fixed payments. We are assuming that the Medicare and Medicaid fixed payments will continue in a similar form. In particular, we believe the Medicare all inclusive population based payment or AIPBP will still reconcile the fee for service. We are now, however, budgeting the Medicaid Global Payment Program, or GPP, for the uh, participants who started the pilot year of this program in 2024. There are five hospitals and all of the comprehensive payment reform practices currently participating. So the budget for next year includes those organizations. There is opportunity to expand to other hospitals. We have not budgeted this just because we're going through the process of um, trying to figure out if there's interest in this. Uh, personally, I believe that there's some value from the experience of expanding this to uh, other Medicaid lives with the potential for a head launching to the future, but we're evaluating that with our participants. And we do not expect a commercial fixed payment option in 2025. Uh, and just noting in the top right bar chart, we manage uh, somewhere in the ballpark of $620 million of, of fixed payment dollars for hospitals and primary care. So it's a a big part of our responsibility as an ACO. Next slide. The risk model incorporating the budget is consistent with the risk mitigation plan approved by this board in June uh, that Michelle referenced earlier. There are some notable sub arrangements um, that I wanted to share today. 
We plan to continue with the risk mitigation arrangement for Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital. This limits their Medicare risk to 1%. We are also holding the risk for the St. Albans primary care providers beyond their accountability pool level, which enables their continued participation through the end of the all payer model. Next slide. Taking a look at total risk, the budget assumes a 3% risk corridor for both Medicare and Medicaid and similar terms within the commercial plans. In total, the risk expected for 2025 is $29.5 million. The most notable change is in the Medicare space, uh, $5.7 million reduction. Uh, recall that in 2024, there was a 4% risk corridor, and based on the economic stresses that many uh, provider organizations are facing, we felt it wise to reduce the risk corridor down to 3% for this last year of the all-payer model. The pie chart on the right shows how risk is apportioned amongst different entities within our state, 83% goes to the risk-bearing entities, which are the hospitals. One Care is now holding 8% between the St. Johnsbury component as well as uh, the St. Albans primary care component. And then the accountability pool is 5% for non-hospital primary care and 4% for hospital-owned primary care. That split is based solely on attribution. Next slide, please. Okay, now we're going to shift into the revenue space. So this gets more into the One Care operational realm. Starting with the program and other revenues, uh, just to note, a uh, pretty significant jump from 2024 to 2025 in the total 16.6 million up to 122.9. The big difference there is inclusion of the Medicaid global payment program funds that flow through. Geographically, we decided to put it in this category because those that 109 million is actually not part of our total cost of care that we're accountable for. It's really a, a funds flow that comes through to one care. We pass on to providers. So it's it's dollars in and dollars out from our budgetary standpoint. We are assuming in this budget that the payer funding levels follow attribution estimates and no other substantive changes assume that a different uh, PM PM from a payer. And we believe that the $2 million value-based incentive fund will continue into 2025. I'd like to speak a little bit more about deferred revenue and in particular, the deferred participation fee row in this table. We expect to fully use the 2.2 million of deferred PAR fees in 2024's business. The roughly 1 million that we have budgeted for 2025 relates to our population health model program. In 2024, we assume that 60% of the bonus payments would be earned by participants across the network. Current data suggests it will be closer to 45%. So what we have discussed with the One Care Board and Finance Committee is deferring any of those population health model payments that are unspent in 2024 to help fund 2025's programs. This is one way that we can help offset or reduce hospital participation fees in 2025. Next slide. And with that, uh, there is a 6.4% reduction to overall hospital participation fees uh, in this 2025 budget. There's a reconciliation of all the different components and line items on the right. Uh, but looking at the, the chart on the left, you can see that we've been trying to manage this number down over a couple of years. They were uh, very high back in 2019, too high in my opinion. When the pandemic hit in 2020, we made efforts to thin out as much as we could. Uh, there was a little bit of a bounce back in 2022 when the delivery system reform funds ended. Those are state and federally matched funds that we used to support this work. And since then, we've really been trying to manage this number down just to be supportive of our Vermont hospitals and, and mindful of the financial stresses they're under. Next slide. Okay, now we're going to shift again into the expense side of our budget. Population health expense overview. We are maintaining our core initiatives from 2024 in this budget. Uh, one notable change is an integration of the mental health screening and follow up program into the population health model program. We've learned through time that having a singular program or platform 
is easier for participants to understand, follow, um, and it provides a more focused way to engage with them. So rolling the accountabilities of mental health screening into the population health model program, we felt was a good decision. We have made some incremental changes to the PHM program payments to again, increase weight on outcomes. The base payments incorporated in this budget will be moving from $4.25 PMPM in 2024 to $4 PMPM in 2025, so a modest reduction there. But we are significantly enhancing the PMPM potential for outcomes from $3.15 up to $5.25. So again, trying to put more and more weight on the outcomes and the results that we all want to see. We are also assuming in this budget that 50% of bonus payments will be earned. It was 60 in 2024, and I'll speak about this in a moment. We have not made any significant budgetary changes to the CPR, Comprehensive Payment Reform Program model for independent primary care, uh, but recall that their payment rates are now linked to the total cost of care. So we will give them an inflation rate tied to that, which we think will be in the 4% range. So it's nice to see that we can give an inflationary increase to our independent primary care practices participating in this program. The regional clinical representative RCR budget increased from 250,000 to 300,000. That's so that we can serve all corners of our state. We've increased waiver implementation funding up to 300,000. We are getting uh, fantastic ideas from participants in the network about how we can leverage these waivers. We've learned a lot about them, both us at OneCare and uh, organizations in the network, about how we can leverage these waivers. So we want to ensure we can support their launch. We also want to help with any transitions to a future model so we can sustain these benefits. So happy to work uh, with the state um, in any capacity to help ensure that patients can benefit from these waivers uh, into the future. And we've budgeted blueprint to increase by the all-payer model trend of 4.0%. To dive into the population health model evolution a little bit, I mentioned that we are again adjusting the base uh, versus bonus potential. We've included a three-year stack bar chart that shows that the, the bottom blue section has declined slightly over the last couple of years as, we, as we've thinned out the guaranteed base payment piece. The green section in the middle represents our commitment to increasing the weight on bonus, and it's a significant increase between 2024 and 2025. This means that a practice that performs exceptionally well in these measures will, will earn a significantly a greater amount in 2025 than they would have relative to 2024. It can be a little difficult to see this on our budget because we, we are estimating that uh, a portion of the bonus payments will be earned, but the bottom right table shows the way that we've integrated the mental health screening payments. And this shows that if everybody in the network met all of their quality measures, there's actually more money in this one care, 2025 one care budget than there was last year. Next slide. This table shows a breakdown of all of our population health expenses. These are all the payments that go out to our provider network, either as base payments or incentives for outcomes and, and results. I peeled out of the top section, the, the global payment program payments, just because there's such a significant difference from one year to the next. And what I really wanna focus on is the very bottom row of this table. Uh, as Michelle mentioned early on, there was a budget target that said we need to maintain our population health uh, investment PMPM at or above the 2024 level. So what we've done here is taken the PHM program subtotal divided by average attribution we expect, that's another way of saying member months that we expect to experience throughout the year to come up with the PMPM included in this budget. Um, this was a very helpful uh, target that in that it gave us something to look at and we paid attention to this throughout our budget build when we were setting PHM base and bonus rates, for example, to ensure that we complied with this target. Next slide. So where does all this money come from? The 27.8 million in uh, population health investments, 19.7 is sourced from payer funding. A significant piece of that relates to the advanced shared savings in the Medicare program that funds uh, patients under medical home payments, community health teams, and SASH. Hospital funding, rounds everything out and the hospital funds are really important in our model for two reasons. One, it allows us to fund initiatives that are a little bit uh, 
more payer agnostic or not specific to any one program. For example, RCRs designed to cover all the all populations. And same with waivers. Waivers can be used across different populations as well. The second thing it does is allows us to have uniform investments regardless of a patient's insurance. This means that when we have an incentive for a provider, it's the same regardless of whether the patient is covered by Medicare, Medicaid, or commercial. So it allows us to have a, a very uniform and holistic arrangement and financial model with practices that's agnostic of insurance coverage. Next slide, please. In the operating expense, we have a 4.3% overall decrease, 575,000 and change in this budget. There are 5.1 fewer full-time equivalent FTEs. Some of that relates to compliance work, moving to a contract model that's working very well for us. And as we always do, scrutiny of all other expenses to ensure that this budget is as reasonable as it can be. And we're always trying to balance keeping this as small as we can get it while ensuring that we have the resources we need to fulfill all of our obligations as we enter 2025's business. Looking in the bottom right, just looking at the operating expenses over time, similar story to the hospital participation fees that grew quite aggressively as one care was, was growing in the early years, the all-payer model. And since the pandemic occurred, we've been trying hard to manage this down. Um, we feel it. It's tight at one care, um, but we feel this is the right thing to do. I won't read every line on this, but wanted to include a budget target analysis. So we've included the eight uh, that Michelle read through earlier. I have abbreviated them for space a little bit and then just gave our high level analysis of or thinking as to why we believe we comply. It was our honest intent to comply with all these. So we're happy to discuss, answer any questions, run through arithmetic to uh, hopefully reach a shared conclusion that we've complied with these targets. As I said before, this is an important port point in our strategy when we were crafting this 2025 budget. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Carrie Wolfman from here. Good afternoon. Thank you, Tom. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Carrie Wolfman. I'm the Chief Medical Officer of One Care Vermont and also a practicing primary care physician in Brandon where I've been in the same practice for 26 years and still seeing patients there. Thank you for the chance today to share some of the ACO's positive results with you uh, related to our quality work. We are asking you to help support this ongoing momentum in 2025. Next slide, please. In keeping with our format last year, we are summarizing our projected work in population health and payment reform and our investments in 2025 in four major areas the population health model, the regional clinical representative program, the CPR program, and the waiver support program. So first, um, our, our biggest investment is in the population health model program. And this is really our primary quality improvement platform. What this slide shows is how we're doing in 2024 so far. Our observations and outcomes show that in three of our aggregate targets, uh, which are ongoing areas of focus for us, they're listed um, here on this grid, we have met target. So we've met target in the three that are in dark blue. Performance remains very strong on preventative care visits. Um, for example, the well visits. And also we are continuing to work and emphasize follow-up after ED visits, the number four measure here, which is labeled FMC. That stands for follow-up after an ED visit for patients with multiple conditions, and we need to do that within seven days. We have added for this year, the IET number six and seven, which are initiation and engagement in substance use disorder treatment. Because we identified those as areas that needed some hard work, some improvement. They were uh, where we were performing the most poorly. So we have ongoing um, uh, opportunity to work on those metrics. We have not met targets yet. As of August 31st, um, well, this information is as of August 31st. I want to point your attention to the data source information under the grid. So this information comes from our October 2024 release from Arcadia. This is from our executive summary report. 
in the, uh, in the first four measures, which are claims measures, the measurement period is August 1 of 23 through the end of July this year. The fifth measure, which is hypertension control or blood pressure control, that's a practice reported measure. We are allowing our participants to report out of their own EHRs. And that spans September 1st of 23 through August 31st of 24. The last two measures we get reported from DIVA, from the Department of Health Access or Medicaid. And that time range is April 1, 23 through March 31, 24. I want to now direct your attention to the bottom left corner. This is a SNP from our executive summary in Arcadia, which is showing our trend lines, our um, success over the last 12 months in these four measures that are listed, developmental screening, the ED follow-up measure, Medicare annual wellness visits, and well care visits for uh, ages three to 21. You can see that the trend lines are sloping upward for all of those except for the ED follow-up, which is really fairly static. I wanna point out that uh, these measures are for primary care, but also uh, we count on our continuum of care partners, the home health and hospice, VNAs, um, the area agencies on aging and the designated mental health agencies, uh, to help us, especially with the FMC measure. They receive base payments for that uh, to be in the PHM, but also bonus payments uh, depended on the outcome from the FMC, FMC measure. And just to give you one example of the numbers or the rate increases associated with the trend lines that you see here, uh, just choosing developmental screening as an example. Over the four quarters that we have reported out of Arcadia in the last year, that metric went from 65.2 to 69.4 to 71.6, and now is at 74.2. So we don't only look at these trend lines, we look at the numbers, um, and we believe this upward movement is very encouraging, and it's showing that we are gaining positive momentum. Important to note is that these metrics, this work will continue in 2025 for our PHM with no changes in the metrics. Care coordination, as you already know, is required um, before any participant can access bonus funds in the PHM. And as Tom already told you, for 2025, we are adding mental health screening as a requirement, same as care coordination. We are also adding social determinants or social drivers of health screening, which we also call health-related social needs screening. All of that is incorporated into the PHM for 2025 and is an expectation with accountability before any bonus dollars can be accessed. This is intended to ramp up accountability as well as standardization uh, in these important bodies of clinical work. Next slide, please. Quality work needs to be data-driven. We say that all the time. Um, that's how we operate. Unlike the SNP that you saw prior, this is just an example. It's an Arcadia report, like the ones that we look at on our value-based care team um, as often as we choose, but specifically every quarter with quality teams at the local level, at our participant level. We also now are looking at these with our regional clinical representatives. The data is used to develop performance improvement plans, which we also call PIPs, to direct focused work. As you can see at the bottom of this uh, sample report, we also share insights related to the KPIs that were approved through our governance structure in 22 to 23. And this allows our participants to look at other performance measures such as avoidable ED visits, um, admissions, inpatient admissions, uh, PCP visits, et cetera. You can see them here. Practices can access a static report quarterly like this. They can also access real-time data and drill down to clinical provider level on a daily basis as the Arcadia platform has this operative ability. 
we are tracking and seeing a positive uptake of accessing this data in Arcadia over time. The number of active users increased from 27 in February this year to 96 this month, and active days of use increased from 64 in February to 687 in that nine month time frame. One Care and its participants have the ability to compare PHM data and performance at the HSA level, the organization level, the practice level, and the provider level. So I can go in myself and see how I'm doing on these metrics. Quality teams, including the RCRs, like I said, are using this. It's an expectation. It is driving our work. Next slide, please. The second area of major investment that we would like to continue in 2025 is the Regional Clinical Representative Program. We reestablished this this year to help drive performance in PHM at the ground level. We sought out physicians, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants practicing at the local clinical level, interested in quality improvement, oftentimes already in a leadership role, and our goal was to engage with 10 of them this year. I'm happy to say we've engaged with nine so far. Um, there's one more that's interested. Uh, next year, we would like to hire and engage with 12 such regional clinical representatives because we feel it is really important to have peer-to-peer -peer support at the practice level. Practicing clinicians looking at data, driving performance improvement, with their partners at their practice level. These RCRs partner with the value-based care team at One Care, so it's not just they're not left on their own to do this. We support them, we hold them accountable, uh, and we help oversee their implementation of the performance improvement plans. For 2025, we've had discussions with leadership at the Blueprint for Health, and we will be expecting our RCRs to collaborate more closely than ever with the Blueprint Quality Improvement Facilitators. We're planning to make that an accountability. I wanted to just give you one example of a performance improvement uh, plan related to the FMC measure, which is the measure we asked RCRs to really home in on, first of all, this year. So some of the general steps in these plans are looking at admission, discharge, and transfer information. Do they have it? Do they not have it? Do they have part of it? How can we help them get what they need so they can look at which patients have been in the emergency department? They are also working, working on opening access to the primary care clinician schedules and asking them to get these people in within seven days. That's part of the expectation. So, I think by working on these um, PIPs, as we call them, we will over time see that rather flat line on FMC going up. We started engaging in May with these RCRs this year, so they haven't had a lot of time yet uh, to show us what they can do. But based on our conversations, their engagement, uh, and some of the work that we're seeing, we do believe we will move that metric uh, going forward. That metric really is a proxy for access to primary care. It's a proxy for reducing ED revisits and inpatient admissions. It's also a proxy for reducing total cost of care. So we've, we've put a lot on that. We will continue pushing hard on that metric. Next year, however, the RCRs will also be accountable for working on another focused area, which is most likely, likely going to be hypertension and also those um, IET measures that I just talked about earlier. And we will work with the blueprint um, in alignment on that work, as I already said. Next slide, please. Our third investment category or program in 2025 will be ongoing support of the comprehensive payment reform for primary care. The practices currently in CPR are being paid at nine and a half to 10% of the total cost of care, which I think all of us knows, know is substantially higher than the average primary care um, 
um, payment or revenues across the country. On average, these practices receive 145% of fee for service. All but two of the CPR practices currently have committed to the staffing uh, partnership model for mental health follow up. We ask them to integrate mental health care into their primary care homes, which they are doing. So this is our tier three, they get more money to do this. And we have increased from last year to this year in the number of CPR practices who are doing this. Um, I think it went up by 20% approximately compared to last year. Additionally, uh, as Tom already explained, all Medicaid membership is included um, in 24 in the CPR program model. Next slide. CPR practices are also performing well. At a high level, our 2024 observations and outcomes in the CPR programs is that they are outperforming other primary care practice types, which is shown here. And this is based on the percent of bonus payments, PHM bonus payments that they are earning. So overall, they are earning 51% of available bonus dollars through October. That's higher than the other practice types, as you can see here. The adult and family practices, likewise, are earning higher levels of bonus dollars than the other practice types. Only in the pediatric CPR practices do we see that change um, down to 41%, and some of the non-CPR practices are earning slightly higher than that in the, in the pediatric practices. We think this is uh, due to their level of engagement, their level of commitment, their level of working with us on quality. Next slide. Our fourth investment in 2025 is our waiver support funding program. One care waiver funding programs and pilots continue to make a difference in patients' lives in Vermont. The impact of waiver implementation really is one person at a time. And while you might say that over 1,000 Vermonters who've benefited isn't a high enough number, it really does, um, this program really does promote right time, right place for patient care. So far this year, as I said, over a thousand patients have benefited from waivers and the year's not over. This is the closest that we at OneCare get to individual patient work. It is really interesting to see the creativity that is coming through on um, applications for the fraud and abuse waivers in particular. The funding supports innovative work through the fraud and abuse waivers, and also through the benefit enhancement waivers, which are a little different, and I'll talk about that next. You can see on this slide on the left that the fraud and abuse waivers are provider designed, and they're designed for flexibility. They allow us to get around some barriers to care for patients that we normally face. Um, we regularly make these available to support discharges. So to utilize a, a fraud and abuse waiver, our participants don't have to get this funding from us. They can fund it themselves. They do apply through us for the waiver uh, implementation. In 2024, we uh, put aside three, $343,000 um, that has been awarded to 17 diverse projects. These uh, applicants went through two rounds of um, application, excuse me, we had two rounds of application and the applicants went through a very um, um, difficult and um, interesting uh, selection process. We wanted to fund $100,000 with the first round and we had 15 applications. We chose six projects that we thought uh, applied to ACO activities and also had the potential of being scaled. In the second round of funding, we had 17 applications and have chosen to fund 11 projects. As you can tell, there's been a lot of interest in innovating to provide patient care in ways that we normally can't. I'd like to give you a couple examples to make it um, more realistic. One example is that Addison County Home Health and Hospice, who has a wound care specialist, to help with their patients has obtained funding through this project so that that wound care nurse can follow patients if they go to Porter Hospital or to Helen Porter Health and Rehab Center and continue the wound care that the patients need while they're admitted and also 
educate the other support staff on how to care for the wounds. A second example is that the Brattleboro Memorial Hospital and Rescue Inc., which is an ambulance service nearby, um, obtained funding through this program to implement community paramedics who follow chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD patients, after they've been discharged. They go to the home, they check on these patients, they do some care in the home, they help manage, and this is helping prevent ED and inpatient readmissions. That's the goal. We haven't measured it yet. We will be measuring it. A third example is that Evergreen Family Health um, obtained some funding. They wanted to purchase and deploy a retinal scanner um, for patients with diabetes to help diagnose retinopathy. We have some trouble um, getting into specialists, as all of us know, and this is work that can be done at the primary care level. So that practice will be buying one of these machines with some of this money. We are very impressed with the interest, as I said, and would love to continue promoting this work next year. On the right-hand side, the benefit enhancement waivers come through Medicare. They are designed at Medicare and we help implement them. We have implementation plans and we help support and oversee the implementation of these benefit enhancement waivers. Currently for 24, I just lost my screen for some reason, I'm sorry. I think it's my computer. So in 2024, give me just a minute, I'll find it on my other paper here. The only BE or benefit enhancement waiver that we are supporting is the three-day skilled nursing facility waiver. And so far this year, we okay, have. So for, can, I, can I interrupt for a second? I was getting, sorry to interrupt. I was getting uh, somebody else's computer screen. Um, can anyone else see that? Yes. I saw it too, Chair Foster. All right. Well, okay. All right. It seems to have gone away. Um, okay. Thank you. I mean, I'm just keeping an eye on time. I have a hard stop at 3 30, uh, just to say okay. that so folks can um, plan accordingly. But thanks. Sorry to interrupt. Um, sorry, and I have my slides back. Thank you. Uh, so we have served 228 patients uh, through quarter three in 2024 with this waiver. And in 2025, we will be supporting some additional benefit enhancement waivers. One is um, through, um, we will be working with our home health and hospice on the hospice concurrent care benefit enhancement waiver. This allows patients who are on dialysis to be in hospice. Um, currently that is not allowed. So, but some dialysis patients would like to continue their treatment while they are also allowed to be in a hospice program. We are also going to uh, help implement the home health homebound BE waiver, which means some patients who uh, need home health, even though they're not specifically homebound, will be will qualify for that assistance. We're expanding telehealth next year to incorporate asynchronous dermatology and ophthalmology telehealth. Next slide, please. So again, just on the waivers, um, we do um, want to budget $300,000 next year for ongoing work on those waivers. And so we're asking for that in our budget. Additional contributions and outcomes um, we want to tell you about include an evaluation done um, this year. It was done um, relative to our work in 2023 in the population health model. We um, were evaluated and it was found that our network has engaged um, and continues to engage more over time. Due to improved communication about the PHM program over the last two, two to three years, as well as streamlining that program, there's not only increased awareness, but also increased engagement in the work. We're experiencing more interest in data review, meeting with us to triage the work and supporting the technology advancements that we support. Participants reported understanding the goals and being involved in multiple activities with us to reach improvements. This evaluation also showed that overall, our participants align with national trends from 22 to 23. Uh, average rates of primary care visits, annual well, child and developmental screening increased across practices. And this is mostly consistent with national trends. We're also seeing that a small number of practices um, those with especially large increases in primary care also saw decreases 
in measures of acute care reliance, which is um, described here um, as and in the footnote, it's really the ratio of urgent care and emergency department to acute care visits. So we, we think all of that is very reassuring and, and encouraging. Next slide, please. This uh, slide talks about other ways we're engaging with our network. You know about most of these already. I just wanna say that in uh, this year, we rounded, we had our HSA executive consultations in the spring and just in October. In October, we did something different. We uh, combined two HSAs on average per executive level consultation. We found that that led to um, enriching conversations, sharing of best practices, comparing of performance from HSA to HSA, and then discussion about the findings and areas uh, where we want to focus. The value-based care team continues to have regular meetings and often, often uh, has webinars to describe our work and our programs. We already talked about the regional clinical representatives. And then lastly on this slide, OneCare has hosted two statewide collaborative sessions. The first one you heard about last year, it's related to the social determinants of health or social drivers of health screening. We had broad participation in that early 2024 series. Uh, we had um, meetings that were co-led by OneCare, the Blueprint, the Population Health Services Organization at UVM and the Department of Health. We focused on aligning on best practices and we were really thrilled with the broad participation and collaboration and came to a verbal agreement on what we want to use for that screener. Next slide, please. Currently, we are in the middle of our second series of statewide stakeholder uh, discussions. The topic this time is controlling hypertension in Vermont. We have had multiple grants, lots of money, lots of time and energy spent on trying to improve the um, control of blood pressure in Vermont, and we have not moved the needle very far. We hover around 70%. So we're having collaborative discussions, looking at what the work has been done, where we can identify positive outcomes that we might want to scale. These sessions are co-led by the Department of Health, Blueprint, and uh, with us, we host them at our office in Colchester. This is a wonderful collaborative forum for sharing of information and goals. And again, uh, we're finding alignment and our hope from these four sessions is to develop a shared clinical pathway or best practice um, that we can deploy around the state to work on controlling hypertension. Very important is that we are exploring um, necessary IT enhancements related to digital capture and reporting of hypertension data and creating IT connections with the health information exchange, which is the ideal. And I'd like to point out the attendee organizations on the right here. Next slide. Lastly, we have a section to share with you today. Uh, we're not having a quality meeting with you later, so we want to share with you our 2023 quality and financial results. We're pleased to report that we improved our scores for all three of our payers in 2023, and those payers are Medicare, Medicaid, and MVP. You can see here that from 22 to 23 in Medicare, we increased, increased our score from 65.63 to 73.13%. We improved in depression screening and follow-up plan. We also improved in depression screening and follow-up plan. Um, I think those are similar. Our measure opportunity that we identified in the Medicare um, scorecard this year is engagement of alcohol and other drug abuse dependence, which will be a focus area in 25, as I already said. We are excited that in our CAPS, Prescani patient experience surveys, we saw improvement in five domains. Those domains are patient rating of provider, how well your provider communicates, getting timely care, appointments and information, health promotion and education, and care coordination. We continue to have opportunities in a couple of areas specifically, how easy it is to get a specialist appointment, and also um, stewardship of patient resources. That particular question is, did your care team talk about the cost of your medications? So we have room to work on those. Tom? Hi again, everybody. This is Tom Boris speaking again for the record. 
Very quick overview of the Medicare financial result. The first row, performance versus total cost of care target. Uh, that we beat the total cost of care target by 13.7 million. A big portion of that, of course, is the advanced shared savings component. There is a quality adjustment. It's always negative unless there's a 100% score in the Medicare model. So that's a $702,000 reduction, meaning net settlement was just shy of 13 million. We used 9.6 to pay uh, Blueprint and SASH organizations, which left 3.38 million to be distributed to one care participants, either through the accountability pool for primary care or to the risk-bearing entities. There's no fixed payment benefit or loss because the program reconciles to fee for service. And essentially what this model means is that Medicare contributed about nine and a half million, the difference in those two is sequestration, about nine and a half million to Vermont to help support our initiatives. So the value of this contract uh, to our state was just shy of 13 million. Back to you, Carrie. And in Medicaid in 2023, we also saw improvement from 22 to 23. The score rose from 65% to 81.25%. You can see our improvement areas on the left. We also have some areas of opportunity. One is follow-up after hospitalization for mental illness, ongoing work in the alcohol and other drug dependence treatment, although we improved, there's more work to do there. And then at the bottom, again, controlling high blood pressure, definitely an area of need for us to focus. Back to you, Tom. The Medicaid reconciliation is as follows, performance versus the total cost of care target. We beat that target by 195,000. I will probably never see a program run as this close to the line as this one in my career. So it was call it a break even. Similar quality adjustment, uh, 659,000. So the net settlement is 464,000. That will be payable to Medicaid. Uh, a little bit further down, the fixed payment, uh, pro prospective payment row shows that we beat the fixed payment by 5.7 million. That means that the fixed payment paid in to one care that we paid out to participants was higher than their fee for service equivalent billing by 5.7. And Medicaid contributes in the form of PMPMs or the value-based incentive fund, just shy of $9 million. So this contract yielded $14.2 million to be invested in the provider community for population health improvement. And in our third payer program in 23 MVP, we improved from 45% to 62.63% between 22 and 23. We improved in ACO all-cause readmissions and also in child and adolescent well care visits. We have an opportunity again in initiation and engagement of alcohol and other drug dependence treatment. And there's some initial additional notes here about our diabetes measure in particular. If you look at our scorecard, you'll see that we dropped from the 90th percentile to the 75th percentile. I want to point out that is despite the fact that our rate improved, the benchmark became more difficult to attain this year. We made improvement in overall um, work on hypertension, but the benchmark um, changed, so it is more difficult to uh, obtain the 90th percentile. We have some work to do um, on um, follow-up after mental health admissions and ED visits, which is also noted here. And back to you, Tom. And last but not least, the MVP financial reconciliation. We beat the target in this program as well by just shy of 400,000. There was a minimum savings rate component in the agreement. Uh, we did not cross that threshold. Therefore, there's no shared savings payment to one care and distributed to participants. However, MVP contributed uh, 275,000 towards our efforts, and that's how much we were able to distribute to uh, primary care and other organizations within the one care network. And uh, as a wrap up, before we hand this back to Abe, um, at a high level, please with the 2023 results, the work is certainly not done. I view this work as continuous improvement and I think we're seeing improvement and also some positive momentum and want to continue uh, through the rest of 2024 and through 2025 uh, for the patients that our providers serve. As I said at the top, we are committed to providing consistency to the provider network through 2025 and aiding with any future transitions. We're energized by provider commitment and really eager to deliver our best outcomes that we possibly can and the all-payer model on a high note. And just to say it, 2025 is going to be a challenging year for OneCare with, with the news of our sunset after 2025 performance years. 
Uh, we're going to have to navigate some complex circumstances, but need to maintain a critical workforce to fulfill our significant responsibilities to both the state and the providers that participate. If there are expense savings along the way, those will be refunded to hospitals to the ordinary participation fee uh, policy. So we're committed to doing both, running these programs as well as we can, and also finding some cost savings if possible. And before I hand it uh, back to Abe, I also just wanna say uh, thank you to Michelle, Mark, uh, Green Mountain Care Board staff. You all have been great to work with through this process and uh, I, look in, I look forward to working with you again next year. So thanks. To Abe. All right. Thank you, Tom. And I want to echo that. Thank you to the Green Mountain Care Board staff. I know it's a lot of work to go through this material and to summarize it effectively for the board members. So thank you. And we are here for you if you have questions and want to work with you through this process. I just want to close by saying that I think we all know that this healthcare reform journey that we're on together um, for the brave little state of Vermont is going to continue on well past 2025. And I, I think success is going to depend on our ability this year and in following years to challenge norms, build trust throughout the system, and effectively facilitate collaboration. So that, that's what we're aiming to do this year. Um, we want to continue to focus on the evolutionary change we've been engaged in for years. And, you know, as it comes to trust, I really think Stephen Covey had it well said when he said, contrary to what most people believe, trust is not some soft, elusive quality that you either have or you don't have. Rather, trust is a pragmatic, tangible, actionable asset that you can create. So we feel like we've created that trust with the provider system. We want to keep it going um, because we know that it requires trust to get to yes and to get people engaged and get them involved in healthcare reform in a meaningful way and have them truly work towards change without so often changing things that we trigger change fatigue and people will become dis um, So I, I really posit that if we can agree on the problems we're trying to solve, together envision what the desired outcome looks like, align around the tactics that are evidence-based and applicable and stack hands on how we're gonna measure success, we can get there together. So I wanna, again, thank the staff. I wanna thank the board members. I wanna thank our team for all the work that they put into this. I recognize that these are really challenging times for our country and state. So please know that we're doing our best to be contributors to the long-term success of this work in healthcare that we're all engaged in. Um, I'll say again that we've already started to consider how we're gonna pass the baton to others so that they can continue evolving this work. And that really includes the next generation of our comprehensive primary care program or CPR, our, um, you know, expanded use of waivers, kind of not letting those die at the end of the APM, but really think about should the state proceed with a head, what could could live on from there. Um, continuing to enhance the information sharing that we've, we've we've really brought to the forefront with the ACL model, and then thinking about um, how we can extend quality measure performance well into the next program, building what we've done so far. So, you know, I I, I leave with a caution that. You can't do a boil the ocean scenario where you're trying to solve every problem. I think you've got to be really careful in the future about how you look at this and really avoid constantly changing metrics of success and avoid scope creep, which just happens. Um, if you can't do that, then change fatigue sets in, trust gets eroded, and um, it slows down the work. So thank you. Um, we look forward to your questions. Thank you all very much for the presentation. Um, I'll turn to Ms. Sawyer for any questions the staff may have. Thank you, Chair Foster. I'm going to keep it pretty brief just so we can make sure to have time for all the board member questions. Um, just one question actually in response to the follow up responses from the questions the staff sent your way, One Care. Um, so you'd written most recent. Uh, data shows that avoidable ED visits per thousand during the period of July 2023 to June 2024 have increased by 4% over the prior year. Um, I was curious if you had any insight into what the, uh, that uptick is due to. Um, yeah, that's really it. And, and if there's anything in particular doing to address it, if, if you're aware of the cause. Happy to do my best at answering that. I don't have definite answers. I don't know exactly why that has increased 4%. Um, 
um, we're working hard to reduce ED visits through our ED follow-up measure. Um, it may be that there's still not enough um, primary care access appointments open. Uh, that's different to me than number of primary care providers, but we do need more and more primary care access. Um, patients want attention now. They don't want to wait. And so I do think that drives ED visit util utilization. And I think the best way to address that is with creativity and how we offer uh, visits to patients. So if somebody needs their you know, their uh, splinter address today, and I don't call them back in a timely fashion and get them in, they will go to the ED. So I do think it is, it comes down to probably an access, uh, real time access problem. We are doing our best to incentivize opening access appointments in primary care. I think um, people are trying hard to do that. There's, there's only so much to go around when it comes to primary care appointments, but there's more we, work we can do and we plan on incentivizing and supporting that work. Thank you. That's all from me, Chair Foster. Thank you. I'll open it to the board. I can start with a couple questions. Um, thanks to the presentation. Um, I guess just real quick on the presentation, there's a few specific questions I have on slides. So in slide six, there was a, a couple pie graphs with Medicare and Medicaid uh, spending, I believe. And could you just remind me it, um, how much of, the, of of what amount of that spending uh, reconciles back to fee for service? One hundred percent for Medicare, and how about for Medicaid? Medicaid is uh, essentially zero when it, and I, I'll put a little caveat on that. It's zero relative to fee for service. There's always reconciling activity between one care and Medicaid at the end of the year to ensure payments were made according to the contract and policy. And that usually relates to, you know, attribution changes throughout the year or um, Medicaid eligibility group changes. But we do not reconcile that program to fee for service at the end of the year for Medicaid. Medicare, the entire thing reconciles to fee for service. So in the CMMI team looks at what would have been paid in a fee-for-service environment, compares that to the fixed payment, and then there's a, a cash exchange, either direction, to reconcile that out. Thank you. Um, and then on slide 14, you had um, a chart with uh, a bunch of different... Um, sorry, on slide 14, you have the the chart with the three vertical bar graphs showing uh, 23, 24, and 25 uh, possible payments that uh, practices could get, and that you've kind of showing the decrease in the base payments, the increase in the bonus potential. Has there been a change in the payments between 23 and 24? Uh, as you increase the bonus, are, are practices getting more money on average, or is it keeping the same amount of money on average, or, or how's that, what, what percent, I saw later you kind of mentioned the percentages that practices were getting based upon CPR, non-CPR practices um, of that bonus payment, but I'm just trying to understand, you know, what, what are the, what is the total payment going out and what are your experiences with switching it from a, a smaller bonus payment to a greater bonus payment? That's an excellent question. Um, I, I don't have that analysis at my fingertips, um, but I can kind of I can say that anecdotally we're getting a greater response and engagement from our primary care network. In particular, this is a primary care chart on that particular slide. Uh, I think it's in part due to more weight on the outcomes and uh, the incentives that come with it. Um, but I, that's a really good question about the historical comparison of the 2023 model, which was heavily in that base payment versus the evolution we made through partway through 2024. Uh, happy to do that kind of uh, deeper dive based on our emerging 2024 data. I don't think it has to be 
super high resolution for me, but more of just a, a broad stroke if, if you did do that I dive mean, at some point. Thank you. My, I, I can give a broad stroke, just, you know, sim simple math here is that, um, you know, about half, a little less than half of the $3.15 PMPM in 2024, we expect to be earned. So call it $1.50 PMPM being paid out. Um, probably a similar amount and you know similar percentage back in 2023 that was the very first year of this program so i believe based on some high level math that in 2024 providers will receive more funds but i'd like to do the actual exercise to confirm that okay did you have a thought on that is that Yes, thank you. I think it's important to note that in our 20 in our October rounding, our HSA consultations, we let everybody know how much they hadn't earned yet as of that point in time. So we had the actual numbers, we showed it, and this was seen by um, all the people at the meeting. So we're trying to make sure they know there's still money on the table and incentivize work throughout the entire year so that they don't um, miss out on that trying to help them get as much as they can of it. Great. And on slide 16, uh, which is two slides after that, it's the population health funding sources slide. And you had payer funding and there's uh, community health team funding, PCHM payments. Um, does the blueprint funding come in here? There's the SASH funding is in here, but is there blueprint funding in here as well? Is that the community health team and yes, patient center um, medical home payments? When we refer to these, you know, blueprint and SASH payment, it includes those three categories: the popular uh, patient-centered medical home payments, which are PMPMs paid directly to primary care practices, community health team payments, which go to the community health team uh, entity within each HSA, which is sometimes a hospital, sometimes an FQHC. Those are in the blueprint label. And then SASH is the third component. And the way that these are funds coming into Vermont is that our Medicare total cost of care target is increased or padded by that roughly nine and a half to $10 million so that we have a favorable target at the beginning of the year. And that essentially brings the cash flow through one care that we then distribute out to the, those entities. Okay. Thanks, that's all I have for now, I think. Thank you. Any other board questions? Robin, I think you're still muted. Sorry, I was trying. It looks to... like your mouth's <laughs> moving there, yeah. <laughs> trying to talk. <laughs> Does that work now? Okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, so my first question was, uh, for the 2025 budget, you had also the option of a new asymmetric risk quarter um, offered by Medicare, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about why you chose not to pursue that, or if you're still evaluating it, um, sort of what impact that would have on your budget. Great, uh, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, so we have the option of selecting an asymmetric risk corridor in the Medicare program, which means the savings potential exceeds the loss potential. That is a generally favorable dynamic to ACOs and, and providers. Um, we are still open to exploring this. We have until December 30th, 2024 to make a final, final decision. But in the budget guidance we received, it was a requirement that if we were going to select this option, one care vermont as the administrative entity needed to hold the risk for the all-inclusive population-based payment reconciliation at the end of the year my my experience is that um, we've had a lot of volatility in that reconciliation amount and i do not believe it's isolated to healthcare cost variation alone um, i want to make sure i get my numbers right i'm looking at our responses here but over the last couple of years, we've seen um, very significant swings in that reconciliation amount. Um, I'm going off memory, but I believe it was somewhere in the $14 million range back in 2023. Uh, we believe it's gonna be closer to the line around uh, 2 million or so in 2024. And we're uh, 
it actually, let me correct myself. 2022 was around 14 million. 2023 was closer to the line. We're projecting 2024 to be a $27 million payment back to Medicare. I don't think that is isolated to healthcare cost savings. Otherwise, we'd see that in our shared savings projections. I believe there's simply volatility in the model used to determine what that AIPBP payment is to Vermont. And because of the volatility that we've seen um, in this particular model, you know, there, there could be a position or a circumstance in which one care could not afford that payment and would put us in a, a bad spot with Medicare. And I, you know, just from a, a personal experience standpoint, advise that nobody in Vermont, one care providers, anybody takes on that risk until there is a demonstrated model that yields more accurate results. Thank you. Um, so in your narrative on page 31, uh, there is a description of the access and equity work group. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more as to whether you are measuring access and if so, what types of measures you are doing, you're using to measure access. My response to that would be that other than our KPI, which we showed you on the one slide for access to primary care, um, we are not tracking it in a different way. In Arcadia, you know, that has been an iterative process. It has taken us most of this year to get all the payers um, data into Arcadia. So um, the reports, the, the quarterly reports did not include all payers throughout the year until this last October report. So certainly we will be using that KPI based on the Arcadia measurement uh, for primary care visits. And we do pay attention to it. It just has not been a full data set uh, until now. Okay, thank you. Um, Dave already asked some of my questions. Thank you, Dave. So also, um, so on page 23 of your submission, you, you speak to some infrastructure expenses that have been removed or reduced from last year. And could you be a little more specific about which infrastructure expenses you're referring to? Sure. Um, this will be a little bit anecdotal, but I'm happy to supply more detailed information. But uh, as an example, e each year when we're developing our budget, we're thinking about advancements to the work that we want to pursue in the next year. That could be a software development, uh, upgrading a platform, for example, our network tracking. We have so many providers in our network, we need a platform to track that. And some software tools have worked well and others we uh, struggle with. So we would build into our budget uh, prospectively some funds to ad advance those tools, advance our work. So when we looked at this year's budget, we didn't actually know uh, we're gonna be sunsetting after 2025, but felt it was appropriate to thin out and really live with what we have in that space and delete any line items that were specifically targeted towards software development or advancement of any of the tools that we currently have in place. Thanks. And then my last question is on slide 22, you spoke about the, um and referred to the blueprint accountability and adding that or blueprint collaboration and adding that as an accountability. Could you just be a little more specific? How do you, what's the accountability metric for collaboration? Or how do you measure that in the accountability part? Good question. We haven't formulated that yet, how we will account for it. It's an expectation, might be a better word, but we will check in. Uh, I had a meeting with leaders from the Blueprint and the Quality Improvement Facilitators. It was their monthly meeting uh, where we discussed this. And, and right now there's not a connection. So we wanna build that connection and we wanna make it a requirement. Um, so what we will be checking on is are the RCRs going to meetings with the QIFs as we call them? Um, tell me about it. What was your conversation? What are you working on together? Are you aligned? So we, that's how we will check in with them. It will be very personal uh, and we will keep track of it. Thank you, uh, that's all I had. This is Tom, uh, thank you for the presentation. 
I have no questions right now. Thanks. I had, I think, just a couple. Going to the, let me get the right document. Um, Appendix 5.2, projected settlement, 2024 accountability pool distribution. It shows a total network settlement of minus 7 million for Medicare, minus 9.9 .9 for Medicaid. I was wondering if you could speak to what was driving that. Sure thing. Uh, I'll start with Medicaid. Uh, it touched upon it a little bit already. The, the two primary drivers, in my view, relate to the repricing activity. And I, I do think redetermination is having an impact on the overall spending within the pool. We've also seen some utilization increases across the network. We're really analyzing and evaluating that now. I'd say it's a, a, actually a mixed bag. Not all utilization increases are bad. And we're seeing some increases in primary care utilization. Uh, other kind of preventative care, uh, mental health supports, therapies, for example, have have risen. Um, so I think there's a lot of factors that contribute to any of these results. It's a big program, but current projections are that spend has been high. We're going to continue to evaluate. We're in active discussions with uh, the Department of Vermont Health Access to make sure we have a shared understanding of the different drivers and dynamics and uh, you know, get to the the right result at the end of the year. So that's our current projection for Medicare. Uh, and again, these projections were prepared last summer. So we had a, just a, a limited amount of data to look at early in the year. Uh, Medicare tended, we had a, a fairly quiet first quarter of the year, but it, in our past experience, the second half of the year is when spending really increases. And October in particular tends to be a very high spend month and November, as well. So uh, a lot of the $7.7 million number you reference is our projection of what will happen over October and November's period and our, our belief that there will be an uptick there. Uh, additionally, there's been some adjustments to the target related to suspicious claims. Uh, you, you may know about the catheter claim issue at the federal level. Uh, so there's been some other moving parts. All in all, I don't know if Medicare's result will be that bad. I'm, I'm kind of hoping, hope isn't a plan, but I am hoping that uh, October and November might be a little lighter based on what we saw over the summer months and we can yield a better outcome and result by the end of the year. And as you're seeing increased utilization in preventative care, are you seeing a decrease in utilization in hospital care? I wouldn't say that we've seen a substantive decrease. I think inpatient ticked up a little bit, but uh, based on our you know hospital structure, some of the the positive utilization in primary care visits and things of that nature actually are from those hospital organizations. But we haven't seen a, an immediate and corresponding decrease in acute care uh, spend. Okay. Do you expect that there will be, or do you not have a sense? It's it's very hard to know. Um, you know, our programs are so big. It's it's really hard to correlate you know, this activity with with another one over in a different area. I certainly believe that through time, if we're able to bolster our primary care layer, see more people upstream, a better preventative visit patterns, that it will yield some savings downstream. But it's hard to be certain that this you know change that we're seeing here will cause this reaction over there. Um, I think it was page 23 of the narrative. Um, there was an increase in the Medicaid total cost of care of $32 million. Can you speak to that a little bit? Sure thing. Uh, we believe, sorry, I just want to pull it up so I make sure I get my notes right. So uh, in, in the Medicaid space, 
uh, the first factor that we really have been looking closely at in partnership with uh, the Medicaid agency in Vermont is repricing. They've made some uh, changes to the reimbursement rates. A couple examples are FQHC rates have gone up substantially. Ambulance rates have gone up. Rural health clinic rates have gone up. Um, so there's a lot of activity. I think much of it is positive, actually, but there's been a lot of activity in the repricing space that we're seeing. And some of these feel small. You know, a reimbursement rate goes up by you know, $5, but this is such a big program with 100,000 attributed lives uh, plus that it adds up to significant sums through time. So we're, we're continuing to evaluate repricing. The other factor, and I don't think this is exclusive to Vermont based on conversations I have with others who have a more national view of Medicaid spending across the country, is the redetermination dynamic. At least what we're seeing amongst our attributed population is that they are the, the lives being disenrolled are significantly less cost. Um, maybe on, on average, 85% of the cost of a life that's continuing on, uh, just on average. So as each of those lives are disenrolled, it does have a significant impact on the remaining pool of attributed lives. That was contemplated in our target or assessing and evaluation, uh, assessing and evaluating whether it was an appropriate adjustment. Um, but this theme seems to be uh, beyond just Vermont. And you know, my suspicion or or hypothesis, if you will, is that redetermination is is resulting in the remaining pool of covered Medicaid lives uh, being much more expensive on average. Um, a lot's changed, you know, in the last year, even last month with your operations, given the sunsetting of the program. Are you anticipating any reduction, either organic or otherwise, in staffing in your final year? My short answer to that is yes. Uh, I, I cannot predict it, however, because it's a very personal decision of what somebody chooses to do. Um, if another opportunity were to come up at some point through 2025, I think um, you know, it's reasonable to expect that some people will move on to a more stable platform to support their own lives and their families. So um, I believe that will happen. The challenge in front of us as an organization is to ensure that we can sustain a workforce necessary to operate the size and scope of these programs. Um, so that that is a the primary focus that we have throughout 2025 is continuing to execute and operate these programs as best as we can and navigate any changes that occur through time, whether a staff person chooses to pick up another opportunity or, um, you know, with hope, a good, a good group uh, stick with us and run this thing out and conclude the all-pair model on a very high note. Do you have any forecasts of what may change in terms of staffing over the next year? I know it's hard to predict, but do you have any forecasts that you've done? It's not not really in any specific way. I can say anecdotally, you know, this has been tough news for the staff. Um, I feel for a lot of them who are very committed to this work. But my anecdotal answer today, and this could change tomorrow or the next day, is that we don't have a mass exodus like tomorrow or January 1st. But like I said, it's a very personal decision if somebody wants to stay and ride this thing out or um, take on other opportunities. So we're happy to keep you informed throughout 2025 of any staffing changes that occur, the nature of the positions that may be uh, or people or roles that are moving on to different opportunities. And it's going to be a dynamic year in that regard. I may have asked this in years past, and I apologize, my memory is off. Um, I was looking at the staffing on 6.4 uh, uh, of the budget guidance workbook, uh, section 6.4, and there's a line item for public affairs of 659,000, 4.9 FTEs for 24, and then 674, 4.75 for 2025. Can, can you remind me what public affairs is and what that does? Sure, I'll take a stab at that. So it's really the the group that organizes our communication with the provider network, um, manages our website. We have requirements to maintain certain public facing uh, materials for anybody to see. They help coordinate our engagements with with you all. It's um, not in any way or, or shape advertising. We really don't do that. It's just really necessary communication and connection work as our, our work, we're, we're this hub of providers and payers coming in 
uh, we have to interface really well with the world around us and they help support that work. Are there any advertising dollars in this budget? And if so, what are they? I can get back to you on the specifics, but in general, we do not advertise to bring in more provider participants. We may have some communications that we have to send out. We have to do participant mailings. Uh, sometimes the, the accounting category might look like we're advertising, but we do not spend any money to solicit new participation or anything of, of that nature. Um, there are times where we think it's important to you know, get the word out about successes, and sometimes there's a cost associated with that, but I wouldn't necessarily categorize it or classify it as advertising in the traditional sense. Are there any, um, uh, are there any finances set aside for lobbying in this budget? We do have an engagement with a firm who helps us with our legislative awareness and knowledge, um, and we've had that engagement for a number of years now, uh, and I believe that's still in our budget. Can you give me the dollar amount of that? If if you want to send it and follow up, that's We totally have to follow fine. up with that, Chair Foster. Yeah. Oh, totally fine, um, but, but thank Thanks. you for doing so. Um, and then... Section 6.10 is the budget by function, and I appreciate the comment that there's some level of estimation as to what goes where, and we talked about that, spoke about that last year. My question is sort of a broad one. I, I am always concerned about primary care and their support and their ability to continue operating and how difficult they are is something we're all worried about. Is there any opportunity in this budget to reduce administrative costs and continue to use that money towards primary care? I think that through time, that is something that is a potential. So, for example, if we do have some staff attrition throughout 2025, what would ordinarily happen is unspent funds are uh, credited back to hospitals through our participation fee policy. That's the way the, the, the model has been structured and built. But if there were uh, expense savings and, you know, the potential exists, those funds could be reinvested in primary care initiatives of some sort. And so that is a possibility. I'll add, though, one of my concerns broadly with the transitions in front of us, and that includes one care ahead, anything else that may be out there, is that there is a... Um, a funding uh, drop off at the end of 2025 for primary care. I'm very concerned about that, which is why I think it's important that we are a, a really part of this transition plan to make that as smooth as possible. So I do worry a little bit about increasing how much goes out there, which just will make the drop off even steeper. So I think we need to be really thoughtful about how that uh, transition works. But conceptually, the answer to your question is yes. Okay, I, I think of that cliff differently whereas if there's more now <laughs> it helps with the cliff later as opposed to being a bigger drop off it's more that you have to handle the subsequent drop off was how i was considering it um and i i'm going to put in a plug that that would be very very valuable given all the incredible uncertainty about whether or not the state was ahead what ahead would actually ultimately look like what the other massive federal changes may be coming down the pike um that would certainly, at least in theory, help with the hospital expenses and their ability to have patients in the right care, right place, right time. So if there are opportunities as you guys sit here and continue to look at this budget with this new news, I would be very pleased if there were increased payments in CPR or to primary care practices to help deal with the future uncertainty. Um, I'm very worried about that for our state. So thank you for thinking of that and, and if you have any thoughts, we really would encourage them. Um, last question I have is, it's a $12 million budget. And, you know, the, the One Care efforts have had some benefits and some things that didn't go as well as we all hoped. We all know that. Uh, there's been things that were maybe surprises and exciting and others that we were, didn't quite hit expectations. Do you believe a $12 million administrative budget 
will have at least a $12 million benefit to the state of Vermont in fiscal year 25. We think it has multiples of that. That's why we presented it. Okay, and how so? And, and we present on that for over an hour that we believe we have a multiplicative effect on the ability to get more resourcing, more information providers to make sure that patients get the best care that they need to utilize resources in a more effective way than a fee-for-service does system does. And we, quite frankly, I mean, we're the ones that are putting more money into primary care. Nobody else is doing that in the state. That's been the vehicle that's been used to do it. I don't have any other questions, um, but thank you all for uh, another budget presentation this year. Uh, Michelle Sawyer, anything else from you? No, thank you, Chair Foster. Okay. I will turn it to the healthcare advocate. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, board staff, and thank you, OneCare. Uh, well, we've done a few of these over the years. Can't help but mention that. Um, um, I was looking at, I just really had one area of questions uh, looking at slide 17 and um, looking at the five, reduction of five FTEs um, and um, noting the, uh, well, uh, and noting the, the uh, you know, 30, $2,000, I think, reduction in staff costs. And um, that just, you know, I don't know what the average uh, cost of uh, compensation cost is for, you know, those five FTEs. Um, I'm wondering what's going on there. Can you say a little bit more about uh, where the savings are for those five FTEs um, and how that's showing up? Sure thing, and I believe this is my eighth budget testimony, and I did one at Howard Center preceding that, so yes, uh, it's been a long road. Um, yeah. I, I think that we uh, refer to this in our answer, so I want to make sure I don't yeah. uh, conflict, but there are a couple moving parts uh, to this. So yes, we do have fewer FTEs. We budgeted a 3.5% cost of living increase across everybody, so that consumes some of the savings. The other uh, more material uh, adjustment in this particular area related to our fringe rate. We again were bolted to the UVM Medical Center and our fringe rate went up uh, about 4% this year. So that adds a little bit to the staff cost projection. The third is that we have a couple of positions that are essentially annualized in the 25 budget. So we you know recently added to the payment reform team. That position was only you know in this year for half of the year, but next year it's a full year of that position. So we did do a reconciliation of the difference year by year, and those three components account for just about all of it. Um, and as we discussed before, 2025 is going to be a dynamic year. I do expect some staff attrition. I hope it's not significant. Um, but uh, as we were just discussing, there's options to either refund or reinvest those dollars as the year goes on. So I, I, I'm not hearing you say that, uh, aside from fringe, uh, and you know, increased costs that you're expecting to have any increases in uh, compensation for for anybody this year. I don't. Uh, none. None of those were it built into this budget. I don't expect that to happen. But again, 2025 is going to be a dynamic year, and we're going to have to make sure we sustain a critical workforce. So um, we'll see how 25 unfolds. But nothing was built into this budget beyond what I mentioned: the 3.5 percent cost of living increase. I think that's it for me, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we can take public comment via raise the hand. Uh, Liz, uh, is it Genge? I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it's, your last name incorrectly. Perfect. Yes, thank okay. you. Um, I'm Liz Genge. I'm the SASH director at Cathedral Square. And this is the first time I've listened to this budget. So um, it's really impressive. And I was excited, especially about the work and the waivers. Um, so just thank you for that. 
My question is pretty specific. It's just around the expenses on the budget. I think it was slide 13, where you mentioned that there'll be a 4% increase to the blueprint. And I'm just, you know, just with my role, I'm assuming that also means uh, SASH. So I just want to confirm that that is the intention there. Sure thing. So yes, that, that is the intention is uh, every every year we get a trend rate under our agreement with CMS under some specific guidelines. We believe that uh, can be up to 4%. That's at the discretion of this Green Mountain Care Board, in fact. And what happens uh, in the one care space is once whatever trend rate is approved, that inflation rate is applied to the blueprint and SASH payment amounts and passed through in full. So based on the budget that we've built, there will be a 4% increase to the SASH line item. Thank you. You're welcome. Walter. Hey, Owen. Uh, you pretty much asked my questions and I thanks for that. That was the lobbyist and about the you know what kind what one care has really done for us considering its budget so i'm not going to go there with that question is it possible to find out who or how much i mean the public to find out how much they spend on lobbying and who does it is that's our money that we're spending paying to one care to do that or is that against the law uh, or Nope. Um, anything that's in the budget is uh, is a transparent process. Um, so I think the answer to that is that that is not inappropriate. Um, Great. Thanks, <laughs> Mr. Fisher. I, I was just going to answer Walter's question. Walter, the Secretary of State has a great, very searchable web page where you can look up any entity and see how much they're spending. You, you can't see how much they're going to spend, but you can see how much they spent last year. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Mr. Boyce? I'll just add that we're, we're happy to send that number in. I just want to make sure I give you the right number. Um, public record, I can give you an estimate if you like of what I believe it to be, but um, happy to just submit it later too. That's fine, you can just submit it later, that's fine. Thank you, thank you for doing that. Any other public comment? Okay, great. Um, well, thank you all for your presentation this year. Uh, we appreciate you answering all of our questions and for submitting materials. Thank you. Is there any old or new business for the board? Okay, then I will move that we adjourn. Thank you. Um, thank okay, you, Aaron, for your help. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Michelle. <laughs> oh, no, you're fine. You go off the record. Thank you, Michelle and staff, for all your help and work on this budget. And uh, all in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 And we are adjourned. Thanks. <laughs>